Okay. Yes, introduction, very short. Uh, I spent some more time in the first part, which you can look on the slides. I'm doing training and troubleshooting, and my favorite topic is wireless. And I have some experience. I did a lot of troubleshooting over the years, and we saw in the first part, we saw a typical layer one problem, wireless Wi-Fi interfering with non-Wi-Fi devices, which we isolated by finally by using the MetaGeek Wi-Spy. In this part, we are going to focus uh, solely on Wireshark. So we assume the media is okay. We assume the media layer one is working. If not, go back to part one and try to find why it's not working. There should be probably uh, a disturbance source somewhere. Okay. I already mentioned also that our focus is uh, understanding the management on control frames and not the data frames. The data frames do not help us at all. The data frames in most cases are not decodable anyway because they are encrypted, except in this hotel. So, uh, but it's no need to see the data. You still can do troubleshoot, and that's what I want to show you here. And in many cases, you don't get the session key, or they are working with certificates. So how can I troubleshoot without decoding higher layer protocols? And that's what I'm going to show you here. So we are going to look at the most frequent packets, but again, this cannot be complete. There are 15 different packets which we cannot cover here for time reason. But I'll just show you how Wireshark presents them how, uh, what you can read. But you need to understand all these packets, otherwise you cannot expect to isolate the problem. There are more packets here, power safe, pull, which I had to jump here uh, and things like this. Stations can go into power safe mode uh, and still can be uh, receiving frames and things like this, so, yes. I also have here, uh, like in the first session, I have a practical example. Uh, an I, a client which uh, had a rowing problem, that's uh, again from a customer case, which was uh, present for many, many weeks and a lot of finger pointing and we, ca we finally could isolate uh, the course or with Wireshark. But then we end with analyzing uh, frame aggregation. Frame aggregation means that you can send multiple packets without an acknowledge. So what we learned in the first part is that every single packet is acknowledged. This uh, is still the case, except you are using block uh, transfer and 11N and AC are using this. So we learn a new packet called Block Acknowledge and see, we'll see how this is uh, going to work. So here a list of the frames which are visible in the air. This list is not really complete uh, if you compare with the standard. In the standard there have been more of these frames defined, but these are the ones which which you normally would see. So let's focus on these ones. These uh, are, if you understand this, then you understand how to travel to. The beacon, of course. Yes, before we look at the frame, uh, let's see what I mentioned already. Initially, wireless was called wireless ethernet. But that was just a marketing term uh, to convince people that it is as easy troubleshooting as Ethernet, right? It has not much to do with Ethernet. Not at all. Not even the frame format is the same. We have a, a unique frame format we will see with completely different fields. At least we have one thing in common, 
the MAC addresses are still 48 bits. That's the thing we have in common. But the number of MAC addresses may vary from 1 to 2 to 3 to 4. So you can see all these frames mixed together in the same trace file. We already discussed in the first session that the acknowledges have only one MAC address, the one for the receiver. And we will see frame with two. Most of the packets have three MAC addresses. But if you're working in a repeater mode, you may even have four addresses. Because in the air, you have to address everything. Remember, when you send out a packet here, it can be received by all your neighbor clients, it can be maybe received by multiple access points. To which access point you are addressing your packet. So the very first MAC address in a packet is the receiver of your packet. That means the MAC address of your access point. Once you assign to an access point, you will use the MAC address of this access point for all the frames you are sending. So it's not a frame for everyone, it's a frame for you specific MAC uh, access point. And that's what we are going to see. So this is the first thing which is very different. So let's see how these addresses are arranged. You need to understand this. Let's look at the two direction. We, are, we have the term distribution system. Distribution system is the term for everything which is access point on and behind. And once a station is associated with an access point, all the packets are sent to the distribution system. Even if the packet is for the neighbor in the same cell, you don't talk to your mobile client neighbor anymore. You send it to the access point and the access point sends the frame back in the air. Very important. Okay, why do we need three addresses in the air? I told you already, the frame sent out by this station may be received by multiple access points. So you have to tell exactly for which access point this frame is this time. So the first MAC address in this frame is the MAC address of the access point. Let's assume it's a Cisco, most popular one, just as a brand. Okay, the access point receives this frame and removes the MAC address. It converts the frame into a standard Ethernet frame. Because on the Ethernet we only have two MAC addresses, right? So it removes the MAC address of the Cisco and in the original in the original Ethernet packet, you see the original MAC address of this station and the MAC address of the destination. So you don't see any difference. You cannot tell if this frame has initially been sent over the air. It's completely, completely native Ethernet frame. So if you look here with the Wireshark, you see the MAC address of this guy, let's say this is an Intel, and let's say this is a VMware, and you will see here, do VMware from Intel. The same by way back. Now this station here sends out the frame from VMware to Intel. The frame hits the access point, and the access point adds the res uh, you have to, we have the same order like here. So the first uh, address is the receiver address, which is now the Intel. The second is the Cisco, and the third. What is the order of these addresses? It's actually very easy. On the very first position is always the MAC address of the device which takes the frame from the air. So if you send a frame towards the access point, it's the MAC address of the access point. If the frame is coming from the access point, it's the frame for the, end, uh, the address. The second is the transmitter address. And that's what makes it a little bit confusing if you look at Wireshark. You may see the address uh, two times. For example, you may see it as a source address and a, and a receiver address and so on. So don't get confused if you look at it closely. Uh, it's the same address, just under different names. 
So here, this is actually the source address, but it's also the transmitter address. Frame number. Come on. Sometimes my cursor is appearing, sometimes not. So, okay. So this is the source address and the transmitter address. This is not the destination address. This is the BSS address and the receiver. And so on. So that's a little bit. Okay. The direction of a packet is actually marked in the details. So let's quickly open our Wireshark. Remember, you have this trace file uh, available. Let's look at the data <coughs> packet here. And if you go down a little bit, and let's say at uh, this TCP sync, if you look into the detail, then you will see here in the flags, you will see. <coughs> Let me quickly show, not in the radio tab flags, but in the IEEE flags. You will see that this is a frame to the distribution station. Frame from station to distribution system via AP. So if you see the T bit here, it's two. It's not always easy to tell the direction, right? If you don't know the MAC addresses, uh, it's uh, it's kind of hard, but here the two. But this bit is only set in data packets, not in control packets. It's not in uh, present there. But let's have a look in this frame. So this frame is obviously sent from a Philips hardware address. So let's compare it to our drawing. Quickly go back. So let's say this is our Philips. It's a very old trace. Philips obviously used to make their own wireless card. That's, I think, not the case anymore. So this guy has sent the packet to the air. So this guy is the transmitter, so it should be at the second place. At the first place should be the MAC address of the access point. Sorry. Here it is. Okay, so you see here the receiver address is Cisco. MAC address <coughs> of the access point. The transmitter and the source address are the same. It's the same field even. It's just under different names. So don't get confused. We have a lot of MAC address, but not that many as stated here. Right? <coughs> the destination is finally the station on the distribution system. So that's the final destination. So you have to get used to this a little bit, but it helps if you, of course, understand this drawing here. So you have an indicator. Now we are looking at the next one. This one is coming uh, to, from station, and this one is then the reply. So we have the F bit set here which says this guy is coming from. If we are here, we also are looking at the retry bit here. That's the one which we are going to look at. That's the one which is going to be marked if a frame is not acknowledged of, at the first time. So in this case here, we see all the frames acknowledged immediately. That's fine. That's how it should work. If we don't see an acknowledge immediately, the same frame will be retransmitted and the retry bit will be then be set. And remember that can be used uh, to uh, find out how many frames are retransmitted. I even made a button here which is uh, in your profile, Tell me all, show me all the packets which retries. So you can easily press this button and then look at your counter and then you say OK 3.6% that's probably something you have to accept. How long does it wait before a retry? How long? Yeah. It's, it has to, it has no privileges. It has to follow the normal process. It has to maybe queue up okay. again. So there is no special frame 
space for read drives. But it knows after the shift, it knows that it's, that it's not received, right? Yeah, how long does it wait for it knows it does not receive, yeah? It knows it is not received, so it keeps the frame in the in the buffer. Yes, but the, the time when it knows is, is the shift time, right? The, the short, the short, the short interval. Because after the short interval, there should be an act. Yes, right. absolutely. Right. Okay. So here it's either from distribution system or to distribution system. These are the two directions. Um, if you want, you can also make a column with this one, of course. Now the acknowledge, one more time. One more time. Every packet in the air should be acknowledged. And the acknowledge has only one MAC address. So let's go back here. Let's get rid of our read drives. And that's really strange here. You probably never saw this before, but the source address remains empty here. And that you have got to get used to it. But that's pretty normal, and let's follow this uh, uh, just step by step. So let's take here this first frame, which has been sent from our Philips to the D-Link via the access point, Cisco. So we have only two addresses here, but in real time we have four, uh, three addresses. So you could add a column here for BSS again if you want. So this frame is going to receiver address Cisco. You can verify it here. The receiver, the station which takes the frame from the air, is the one which has to acknowledge it. It's not the final destination, it's just the next hop. The access point is not the destination, it's the receiver. That's why we use different terms. So the acknowledge which we see next has to come from the Cisco and has to go to the Philips. Because we know that an acknowledge always refers to the previous frame, we can leave off the source to save bandwidth. And that's exactly, that's exactly what they did. So you only see the acknowledge here we know it's coming from Cisco, but it's not in the pack. This makes it kind of hard to filter. I'll show you in a minute how this can be tricky. But it works. Again, if a frame is not acknowledged immediately within the SIFs, then the guy here can do a retransmission multiple times. He even may, we will see this in the phrase, he even may negotiate the, uh, the, the speed down. The client has, may have been re uh, moved away from the access point. Maybe the signal uh, uh, becomes weaker. So it may uh, re repeat the same packet 10 or, or more time. And you will even see the speed going down. If you have a column with the speed which we saw before. And that's exactly the bit which you can use to filter on and which gives you an idea uh, what is the percentage of, uh, of retransmitted packet. During these retransmits, it's still locking the frequency, right? Still? Yeah, so it's still locking the frequency for these retransmits. So yes, of course, it's locking, uh, it's, it's, it's listening if it's free. Okay, so if you it's not locking in a way, you cannot lock, you just can send and then it's locked. You've got right. a client that's kind of way out there, a lot of noise, yes. he could be taking up all this retransmit time on the frequency on the channel? No, because he, as, as soon as the guy realizes it's busy, he has to be quiet. He listens before send, like any other else. Okay. So he cannot... There's no priority. Yeah, yeah. there's no priority, okay. He cannot dominate somehow, he just retransmits. Oh, okay. okay. But it has, to, it has to be free before. Yeah. Uh, the only way to steal bandwidth is to be slow. Yeah. Yes. To be slow. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so this is a very important indicator, and this is how I again uh, discovered on uh, our first session that we have a problem if the number of retransmitted pa packets goes up to 70%, then you sure have a problem somewhere, but it can tell you where. Yes. Is that a threshold how many times it tries before it just gives up? No, I didn't find, I didn't find a. Uh, uh, 
uh, uh, standard or whatever. Normally until the knowledge comes, right? <laughs> okay. But I've seen I've seen uh, I've seen uh, products which go up to twenty times, and then there's another way. Then they they switch over to the so-called uh, slot reserve. They uh, way to 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 reserve a slot. So you can define. I think you can define a level of the, how many retries you go to request to send clear to send. We are going to talk about this. Okay. So this is the frame which uh, we don't look at this at the moment. Um, yes. Here is a, a trace file where you nicely see how the same packet is sent and again, again, and uh, how the speed is negotiated down until finally a knowledge arrived at one meg. Right? Nothing, nothing here faked or, or manipulated these are original, original trace files. Um, you just need to make the right filter here. Uh, you have the trace file, that's one, uh, that's one I gave you. So it tries everything possible to retransmit this packet and of course uh, at a certain point it gives up and uh, probably uh, possibly makes a message to the application but we look at this very confusing is the number of standards in the meantime and the problem is we don't get rid of any old standards <laughs> that's the problem with all the technologies and if you go back and look at 1 meg and 2 meg and 5.5 these are speeds from a very old standard and the new standards do not support this speed so it's really amazing a new adapter which supports 11N or even AC it has to support all these different modulations and if it switches back to 1 meg it's sending in the original Barker code which was invented in the 90s so this is still in each adapt and, and nobody dares to remove it. So we don't have one Mac here. We only have six and nine. So we, what you see here is that this guy is changing modulation and, 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 and coding during this process. So that's, uh, that's a legacy uh, load we have at the moment. The, no, none of these adapters, none of these vendors dare to to, to, to skip out an old standard because old stand, keeping old standard would mean no support for these uh, speeds anymore. So uh, we have in the meantime we have AC also with phase one and phase two we are going to look at this so it's uh, really already a long history and in the beacons the access point indicates what is supported and what is required. In the beacons you can require speed. So for example if you require uh, a number 6 then uh, it cannot be a B only uh, client anymore. And we will show you in a minute how you see what speed is required by uh, the beacons. Here it is. So here you see a typical beacon indicating supported rates and if you see a basic here that means this speed is required. You can configure this in your controller here basic speed is 6 meg but you can require any higher speed and then only stations which supporting this speed will also be able to join. So of course. For example, one megabit and two megabit would be allowed to. No, we are in in the channel uh, in the in the five gigahertz channel. Ah, okay. We don't have uh, one there. So where well, you can see this, we are in channel hundred here. Hmm. This is the five gig, and in the five gig, let's go back. In the five gig, the minimum is six, right? We don't have this legacy speeds here. Okay, sometimes you also have problems that a client 
just positioned below an axis point does not join, right? You're standing here, it does not join. And you wonder why. You, you see the signal is strong enough and it keeps probing, right? The reason could be that the client cannot fulfill requirements in the beacon. For example here, the robust security network, the RSM uh, information. In there it says what encryption is required in order to be able to join this access point. This is not an option, right? This is a, a requirement. So we had this case with a, we had the idea we had properly configured, it was a, a phone, wireless phone. We had the idea it's properly configured but it did not join, right? And we looked through the configuration several times, everything here, encryption and everything. But then we looked into the trace file and then we saw that our configuration was not activated on the phone. We had to restart the phone. So the robust security element was not accepted by our phone. So uh, we see in the probe request and the probe response you see what the client supports. So the client did not support this robust security element which was required. In the beacons which become longer and longer these days because more and more option, in the beacons you see also of course uh, what uh, options the, the access point supports. And these terms here like high uh, throughput they come also from this uh, story here. So the first standard uh, was 1 and 2 megabit. Then we came with uh, 5 and 11, that's called high rate, right? High rate. <laughs> so then they called it extended rate. And then they called it high throughput. And now they call it very high throughput. So they may run out of term one day. <laughs> Extremely high throughput. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Incredibly high throughput. <laughs> So this is high throughput. <laughs> so that's these are also the terms which are used here, you see. High throughput, very high throughput. <laughs> so it matches with the with the definition of the of the standards. Okay. So again, probe request is one of the control frames and it gives you information about the client because the probe requests are sent out by the client and in the client in this probe request the client states what he supports right high throughput this is a high throughput 11n um, and what you see here is that the client is probing through the channels but not even not only this one the, prior, the client is probing through stored SSID and this was a secrecy issue because remember when you configure your mobile device you get the selection do you want to automatically <coughs> join if this network is available <coughs> and if you say yes it will store the SSID and will specifically ask for it in the probe so it can disclose where you have been, right? <laughs> and it ha can be misused, for example, for man in the middle. Ma if you sit at the airport and you hear something like this, and you quickly set up an access point with this SSID, then your client would quickly join to this SSID and you may not even notice because the man in the middle may forward you through the uh, page of the airport. So this is kind of dangerous and has been misused. The client is using the, the stored so it is wise from time to time to clear this buffer because it's still also sending a broadcast. But with this, uh, with this SSID, only stations which support this S or access points which support this will uh, reply. So this is the difference. Remember that you can, on the access points, you can decide not to broadcast this SSID, right? 
if you do not broadcast the access ID, an access point will not respond to a probe request not containing the name. So if you send out an SSID broadcast, that means all access points which are within the range and which are broadcasting their SSID, please respond. That's what normally happens. And then you get a list of all the access points available. If you want to hide your, your SSID, then you can only access if you call for it. And then you need in the probe request the name. So that's the, how it works uh, with, the, with the difference here. So that the more addresses you have stored, the more probe requests go out in every channel, right? So it puts quite some load on the, in the air. The, the reply to a probe request is a probe response. And it contains exactly the same information like the beacon. It's like a forced beacon. But it's addressed to a specific address, to the one, to the client which was, was requesting. So let's say here this Intel is sending probe requests. If one of these names is found or if you have a broadcast access point it will send a probe request, probe response but to this address so it's not a broadcast anymore it's sent to this address but it contains the same information like the beacon. Let's look at the authentication association process. Once the client has scanned through all these channels it has a list of access points with MAC addresses and now decides which SSID to join. This is either controlled by you, you will select the hotel or it's controlled by the application and now it compares which access point has the best signal and best features. We do not know exactly what the algorithm is. Vendors keep this closed but we find out by looking at the next type here for which access point the client has decided. So this guy here, this Intel, decided for this MAC address. And you can see it because this uh, station is sending an authentication request to this Cisco. By the way, a lot of companies have access point with multiple SSID, right? It's very common. One for guests, one for engineering, one for administration and so on. These SSIDs are sent out in different beacons. A beacon for every SSID. 10 times a second. So if you have 10 SSIDs on one access point, it sends out 100 beacons per second, right? 10 times on every this act This SSID has a different MAC address. Every SSID has a different MAC address from the access point. And if a client now joins to this MAC address, it's sending its packet to this MAC address. In many cases, these are on the wire side or different VLANs then, right? You want to put the guest frames into a separate VLAN. In the air, we don't have VLANs. We don't have a VLAN tag. It's done by MAC addresses. You can easily see this. I give you an example. The MAC address normally counts up. So it can, you can easily tell which MAC addresses, which networks are from the same client if the MAC address, if the MAC address counts up. For example, let's quickly see here. Let's sort by SSID. And then you see here Normally it's just the, large, the last digit which is uh, changing in the MAC address. I don't see it typically here yet. Now let me see if I sort by MAC address. It doesn't do it really nice. But you see that uh, just the last digit is counting up. Then you can say this is from the same MAC address. 
let's say here the Paradisa for example, let me look at this. No, it's not obvious here, but that's how you should be able to recognize. Okay, let's look at the process here to understand. So once you have this process here, you're in the face of following the authentication and association process of a client. And of course this is very interesting if you have problems, complaints from client, it, 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 it takes a long time until the, uh, the connection comes up. So let's quickly look at this process. So again, look at this frame here. And of course it's acknowledged. This frame has only two addresses. It makes sense, because at this stage we are not sending any packet to the distribution system, right? We are not connected uh, uh, any, uh, yet uh, to an access point. So this frame has only two MAC addresses, the one from the client, mobile client, and the one from the access point. And the one from the access point has been taken from the probe responses. Up here you can see it. That's the probe response. Huh? Okay, so this client now decides to connect to the Cisco 20. The next frame is an acknowledge from Cisco 20, but without the source address. Now we get the authentication response from Cisco to the Intel, and now frame going back from Intel to Cisco. So this is a legacy process which is not used anymore. They would like to remove it, but it's in the chipset. Initially, the authentication was the first step which was done, but that was the story with the WEP, right? Wire Equivalent Privacy. Remember? It was a big mess. It was not properly implemented. So it was not really secure, but it's still there, so you always will see these four useless frames. They are useless today, they are not used anymore, but they cannot remove it. They are in the process of uh, negotiation and uh, it's kind of asking, can I, o can I enter through this open door? And the answer is yes, you can enter through this open door. <laughs> so it's not really... Uh, it was a big story about this uh, wired equivalent privacy, remember? It was really a uh, very uh, image uh, reputation uh, problem for wireless. And it was then when Wi-Fi Alliance came up with the uh, WPA. But they couldn't move the process anymore. So the authentication is now done after the association. The idea was initially to do this before, so we do not associate the station which we do not want, but that story is gone, so uh, no way we can turn this back. So the association is now done in any case. You will not see here a neglect, except you're still using WEP, right, which nobody does, but <laughs> okay. So, the, the, the actual uh, process now, uh, the association request now starts here with the, sorry, with the association request. Again, acknowledged by the access point, which is just a pure acknowledge, this is not the reply. But if this is not acknowledged, we would see the association request again. And now the association response and here in this you get your parameters, you get a unique number from the access point, you get an association number and so on. And now you are also associated. And now you could start in this hotel, you would now start transmitting your probably DHCP request, right? Getting your IP address. So that's it. But in real world environment, you will start now with the negotiation key messages. And you see here, message 104 has been sent to, which is pretty normal. Obviously has been retransmitted here within 1.8 milliseconds. Uh, and then has been acknowledged and message 2 and so on. So we see here the negotiation process. 
if you can follow this with Wireshark and if they are using shared key and if you have access to the shared key you can now enter the shared key to Wireshark and then he can decode the following messages but you need to have this process because the shared key is not used as a session key the shared key is used to retrieve a, a session key and if you have the session key available you can enter it in Wireshark but you still have to follow to capture this process here otherwise you cannot okay I did it here I entered the key and then finally I could decode the messages and then I see the client is now sending a DHCP request and gets an IP address and so on okay yes so the client is now associated and depending whether you have the key or not you can follow the messages or not otherwise you just see here instead of data uh, you can see here uh, encrypted back data packet that's all you would see you would see no IP addresses nothing you would see MAC addresses but you still would see the acknowledge that's the good thing you still could tell that the frame before has arrived properly you still could tell what is the percentage of uh, good and bad frame so you, you still can tell you have a problem in this cell or not and that's uh, which is very valuable because at a certain stage uh, a lot of people point to the wireless wireless is always the weakest link right and you may have to prove if it is wireless or not so in this case we have are associated and we are looking at the roaming client now so I have set up a capture to follow two channels channel 1 and channel 11 so we will see regular we will see regular beacons from both channel and we see one beacon is quite strong the other is quite weak so we are far away from this Cisco and we are closer to this Cisco. Remember the signal to noise ratio? Uh, no, that's wrong. The signal to noise ratio, not the, uh, not the signal strength. So, signal to noise ratio is better here than here. I mixed it up, sorry. So, the bigger the signal to noise ratio, the better. So, this one is the better, 21 is the better than the 60. Now, now let's see where our uh, client is uh, uh, associated to. You can tell here from the color and from the channel. So our client, I was running a ping here, is in channel 1. So that's the one with the worst. That's why he is going to roam in a minute. So he is connected to this one and it will probe from time to time it will probe and that's what we see down here that now yeah the probes are not in here but if you look at the trace file you will see them this is just a screenshot you will see that our Philips now here definitely is moving the channel you see here we see an authentication in channel 11 clients normally do not sign out on the old access point they do not say goodbye or something like this they just change frequency and that's what we see here so the Philips is now moving and tries to identify, identify it with 21 and it manages it happens so again the four useless frame sorry the four useless frame here authentication acknowledge authentication acknowledge and then we see a reassociation re request what is the difference in the reassociation request we have a reference to the previous access point it's not defined what the infrastructure does do with this if it gives a privilege uh, treatment or so depends on the vendor Cisco has some proprietary solution here 
Uh, more or less, it's, a, it's an association request with the reference to the previous access point uh, number. So the number of the previous access point is in there, but the rest is the same. So I set the reference here, and the whole process of roaming was in just four milliseconds, but without encryption. Now the encryption process has to follow if we have encryption. But it's very fast actually. So that's what you can see if you capture multiple channels at the same time, right? I'll show you how a problem out this in a minute. The problem is with roaming that the algorithm is not published by the vendors. What are the criteria for a client to roam? And this, I must say today, was actually a bad design. And they tried to change this with a lot of different efforts. The, the decision when to roam should not be given to the client. Because we always have problems with sticky clients. You may have heard the term. The client is connected to an access point down there, and I'm standing here below this one. Sticky clients. We don't know why, because we don't know what the client needs to roam. We know the signal strength, of course, is a value. We know the signal to noise ratio is a value. We know the error, uh, number of errors is a value. But we don't know how each vendor uh, weights these different criteria. And we have we had always problems with either client standing here and roaming all the time. That's the other opposite, right? Or a client connected down there and not roaming. The problem is every vendor claims to have the best roaming. So that's why they don't publish what criteria influences the roaming process. And it turned out that in praxis, in reality, you would like to control, you would like to gain more control back for roaming. What they partly do now, today we have uh, only more or less controller-based systems. So that means you have a central intelligence which knows all access point. So you can exactly say where a client is. And now, if this client sends a probe request, you could decide whether you give him an answer or not. And then you can control. If you don't give a probe response to a probe request, a client cannot join his access point. So there are a lot of small little tricks now to kind of do load balancing or try to force a client uh, to roll and things like this, but they are all proprietary implementations. The original problem remains. The decision to roam is on the client side. And we do not know what exactly <coughs> are the criteria. We just I said it on some if you look into if you look into driver in your wireless driver, if you look under roaming, uh, I said already you may have uh, roaming uh, uh, features like aggressive, moderate, and normal, something like this. It won't help you too much. Uh, you just can assume that under aggressive it's doing more frequent probing, but you need to go to the lab if you would like to have precise information. So that's a problem which will remain for, for, for a long time, the roaming, the roaming problem. And we had one really very serious with the customer for weeks and months. And it was a finger pointing between the infrastructure company, which was Cisco. Uh, they placed, uh, it was a huge storehouse, and they placed hundreds of access points. And the storehouse was using uh, scanners, barcode scanners, for inventory. And they always, from time to time, were blocked in the range of minutes. Though uh, barcode scanners with a small uh, LED, uh, LCD screen where you could put entries, 
scan articles and enter numbers and so on, uh, they were blocked uh, for minutes. And it, every side refused to really look into it and uh, you know this, you heard it uh, yourself, you are the only one having problem with this and, and things like this. So finally they involved me to look at this a little bit closer. And the, bar tech, the, the, the barcode vendor, that's a nice little story, when I, when I, when I actually captured the file, the barcode scanner had the name Symbol here. And then Symbol was sold to Motorola. Next time I opened the file, it says Motorola here. <laughs> and now Motorola sold it to Zebratech. And now it says Zebratech. How does this work? Wireshark has a, a, a file with all the vendors. And when you open a file, it looks into the vendor code. And if the vendor sells the MAC address to another one, then you have another vendor here. So it's still the same MAC address, but it changed from, from Symbol to Motorola to, to Zebratech. So let's open this file a little bit, because I can show you how tricky Wireshark, how tricky wire, wireless troubleshooting can be. And, uh, uh, of course, I, I help you a little bit with uh, what, what we're looking for. So, the file is okay. Yeah, roaming client blocked. Okay, if you go to beacons. You see a lot of beacons in different channels and you see we are in 5 gig, channel 40, 60. This was also a complaint by the barcode vendor. You have too many access points, you have too strong signals. Try to change the beacon interval. <laughs> so they really didn't know what to do and they asked the customer to change a lot of parameters. Finally it turned out they all didn't help. So we have access points here which are quite strong here, so this is the absolute signal now. So this is probably too weak here, uh, the one in channel 36. Anyway, uh, we are interested in our client. Where is our client associated? So let's make a filter to our client. We have the MAC address of our client, of course you need to know this. It's a Zebratech uh, with 57 at the end. So uh, let's clear our filter here. And that's probably the one which we would like to look at. If I'm right, yes. So, yes, there's a nice new feature now that you can pull just data from here and up. It's, I think, not officially documented yet, but it's quite nice. So, I said VLAN receiver address, I changed to, yes. Okay, so I see here that my Zebratech is sending null function packet from time to time. These are keeper lives. You see this very often. If a station is assigned to an access point, it has to uh, show some activity. Because we don't have the link pulse, the one we have with a wire, right? If you pull the wire, uh, in Ethernet, the switch immediately recognizes this port is gone. We don't have this in wireless. So if a station is not sending traffic regularly, it's cleared from the list. So you have to send from time to time a null function frame. It's a data frame without data. The data frame, but no, does not contain data. It's a keep alive, but it's acknowledged. So we can see 
that the Cisco is at present uh, as, uh, associated with this uh, access point. We know this. So actually we are here in this channel and you see here this going on. Actually what happened is that the client was roaming, was changing the channel and let's see where it happens. Here it is. Uh, frame number 83. Let's go down a little bit, down a little bit. Here, at frame number 83. And then we have a large break of 30 seconds. You see this? So let's see what the last frame is here. The frame number 30, uh, 30 83. Sorry. It's a de authentication. So this client is from the access point is de-authenticated, that means go away, re uh, refused. So uh, the client has to restart again, it does the same process and it happened again here. And again and again. And then suddenly it worked. So what was the reason? If we looked a little bit closer into, we saw that the last frame before the authentication for the authentication was a request identity frame. You see here? Request identity frame. So the process here, the application from the access point through the mobile client was asking for identity authentication for uh, for this station and then we don't see any reply and we see that the Cisco is then sending a day authentication we should see a response identity which we see further down here you see it somewhere <laughs> okay what was the reason what is the problem Let's have a look at this request identity. Can we tell if this request identity has arrived at the Sebratec? If it has arrived, the Sebratec is the problem. If it, has not, if it has not arrived, the Cisco is the problem, right? Because then the Cisco should send retransmission. So this was the big question, right? Where goes the Oscar to? So now you have the impression we cannot tell this is the request identity. So we cannot tell if we see, we don't see an acknowledge, right? We don't see an acknowledge because, and then the, the, separa, the Cisco should transmit again. So if you look at this screen, you have the impression the problem is on the Cisco. But let's mark this packet. It may be that we don't see all the packets. We have a filter showing us all packets from and to Sebratec, right? But now, how would the acknowledge look to this frame? And now you can prove what you learned. <laughs> how would the acknowledge look to this frame? Which MAC address would this acknowledge contain? Would it contain the MAC address of the Sebratec? No. It would contain the address of the Cisco. We won't see it with this filter, right? So that's what makes troubleshooting here kind of tricky. So if we open the filter now, if the next frame is uh, acknowledged from a Cisco, then the Oscar goes to Sebratec, right? If the next frame is not an acknowledged from Cisco, then it's a Cisco problem. Okay, one more time. We see a frame which goes from Cisco to Sebratec. And we see it because we have a filter on the Sebratec. But we do not know if frame 84 is an acknowledge. We don't see it until I release the filter here now. And now you can see frame number four 
is an acknowledge from Zebratech to Cisco. That means the Zebratech confirms I have received your request identity. And if he is not replying to it, then it's his, it's his problem, right? So that's exactly how we could prove. And again, within one week, the problem was solved, right? Once you can really point to... Before, they, they had weeks going back and forth, and now, uh, with this trade, they suddenly became a new uh, software. It was a Windows CE issue, some, uh, some, uh, something. Now you can say the Zebratech has acknowledged that it has received. So it should reply now, and it actually does a reply. It just takes one, one to three times uh, till it replies. Later on you will see it. I made a nice chart then using using um, uh, iograph with the different signals. So you can see here that one uh, access point becomes stronger and one becomes weaker and at one point our uh, client uh, is uh, the authentication and then it needs uh, 30 seconds until it uh, tries, retries and then again and again and again. So the problem was always a multiple of 30 seconds. Sometimes only 30, sometimes a minute and so on. Because sometimes it took two or three uh, requests. Okay. Yes, 10 minutes to go. What you often also will see are these clear to send requests to send frames. Clear to send requests to send. You remember these terms from modems, right? Uh, technology recycle here, the same name for different story. We were talking about different retries. We were seeing a station trying and retrying and retrying and negotiating down the speed. A station at one point can try to reserve airspace for its own purpose. And this is actually what is happening after a number of retries. On some stations you can configure how many retries before request to send clear to send. What actually happens is the station sends out a frame and in the frame it says I would like to have the cell for me only for a number of microseconds. You cannot do it for half an hour, <laughs> but you can do it for microseconds. In this case it was the Cisco towards the Philip, but you often see it from a mobile towards the access point. And the clear to send is now the guarantee. The effect of this frame is this, that all clients in the cell, except the one which is required here, the Philips, all cells are frozen for a moment. As I said, we are not talking about minutes, we are talking about milliseconds. So if a station hears one of these frames, the station, if it's not involved, it's absolutely frozen. That means you can quiet the whole cell for a moment. And then you can send your then can you then you can send your your data without the chance that another client uh, talks to. So look at these frames. If you see a lot of them, you may have a noisier environment or you may have a uh, hidden node if you have nodes too far away from the access point and the nodes cannot hear each other, then you may have hidden node problem uh, in your network and then uh, this may be uh, the effect. Very confusing is now that they have a short form. And you will see this also. You will often see a clear to send without a request to send. How does this work? Because the clear to send has no source, you can, you, you can send yourself a clear to send because the address, the address which is in the clear to send is the one which is allowed to send. 
So this address here is allowed to send. Now if you send yourself a clear to send at your own address and propagate it, you can reserve the network. Again, a nice way to bring down the network, right? And I actually have a trace file from a, from a Mac computer sending out clear to send to itself in a very short interval. It was a bug on the feature. <laughs> but uh, as I said, are these packets using SIPs or GIFs? Say again? Are these packets using SIPs or GIFs to like wait for um, between LTS and CTS is SIPs, mm -hmm. but for the CTS cell you need to have a free air. Okay. No, 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 so this is really new feature here, CTS self. That means the CTS is the same like here, so you don't see self, but the request to send is missing. So it normally works if the stations behave like they should, but again, I have a trace file where a station was continuously sending clear to send to its own address and then the, the rest of the network is down. Yes, okay, so a lot of stuff in here which uh, we have to cover at a certain level only. Let's finish up with frame aggregation. Frame aggregation become very popular with 11N and it will uh, be used even more in uh, 11 uh, AC. In AC. Uh, the idea is to improve not only the bandwidth on layer 1 with channel bonding and everything and, and, and multiple streams and spatial streams, that's a lot of technique to improve the bandwidth, but the idea is to improve the handshake also on layer 2. It is not a very efficient if you acknowledge every packet, every single packet, but that was the way it initially was defined. But the standard is moving, the standard is growing, and with 11N they invented a so-called block acknowledge. Block Acknowledge allows to transmit multiple packets and acknowledge them in one go. Frame aggregation. Two ways of frame aggregation have been defined. The one is not very popular. Let's go back here. They decided to put more multiple packets into one big packet. It's called MSDU. Mac service data unit. That means you can save radio header. You have, you can, uh, uh, you do, you do not have to wait for, for the, the the air become available because once you have the air, you can send up to eight kilobyte. So you only have one header, and once you have the air, you can, as long as nobody disturbs you from non-Wi-Fi device, you can send. But is it really a good idea for a media with a lot of disturbances to have long packets? Not really, right? Because if this packet is hit by a disturbance, just one bit wrong, we have to transmit the whole packet, right? If out of the three one is hit, then you have to transmit the only that one. So this... This... Um, Aggregation is used for point-point links, where you have very directional antennas. Directional antennas have not only the feature that they send directional, but they also receive only direction. But they do not receive disturbances which are coming from the side. So if you have a very reliable layer one, then this is a good idea. But for a normal cell, we use the MPDU, which I'm going to show in a minute. The nice thing is, Wireshark decodes 
this long, long time ago. I don't know when I presented this first time, but many, many years ago, Wireshark was already decoding it. So you see here, in one frame, multiple frames uh, together. And every frame has its own MAC address, you can look into it. And this frame here was 26,000 a byte. But again, more popular became the AMPDU. That means we are still adding packets, but we give them an individual FCS. And we give them a minimum radio header. And they invented a new spa uh, reduced space. So that means the receiver stays in synchronization. We do not need the preamble. So the receiver just realizes a new frame, but it, it, is, it stays synchronized. And now we can, up, we can, uh, we can transmit up to 65 packet, 64 packets. But now, how do we confirm which packets have arrived okay and which not? So you see here how Wireshark does it. We have one line per packet, and then we have a block acknowledge. So we invented a very clever way. It's a little bit comparable with TCP um, selective hack. Uh, you can confirm with a so-called bitmap, for example here, that the third packet to the last has been lost. So it's a simple bitmap we will find in the block acknowledge, which says, please resend the third packet uh, again. And in the next retransmission you will see that the missing packet, each packet has a sequence number, uh, will be uh, delivered uh, one more time, 126, and then we go on with 120 side. It's called a block acknowledge. And Wireshark again decodes this perfectly. You see this block acknowledge here, for example here, uh, you see 64 bit and each bit individually confirms one packet. And if this is not all Fs, like the one here, then one packet is missing because this is EF decoded, right? So it tells you exactly which packet is missing and uh, it uh, will be delivered in the next. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm here for questions.